Welcome to the After On Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Reed. And this is a series of conversations with thinkers, founders, and scientists. Take a little time and stretch out, because these talks are unhurried and meant to bring you to a top percentile understanding of something important. So, whether you're into startups or ideas, a techie or a lit major, take your time, engage your mind, and you'll be glad you did it. Especially this week, when we'll be talking to roboticist and AI trailblazer Rodney Brooks. It's a rare and exalted distinction to be considered a true founding parent of any major field of tech, and it's virtually unheard of for someone to achieve that in two separate domains. But Rodney's one of the very few people who have done just that. When he left Australia for the region that would later become known as Silicon Valley, there were quite literally three mobile robots of consequence on the entire planet. Years later, Rodney would found a company which has now brought tens of millions of these critters into the world. His products have saved countless lives and have also liberated thousands of acres of carpeting from dust, crumbs, dog hair, and other detritus. The realm of AI was almost as nascent as that of robotics when Rodney first entered it, and a separate company he founded became the leading provider of AI development tools throughout the 80s and early 90s. And by the way, he squeezed all of his entrepreneurship in while pursuing a very storied academic career, largely at MIT, where he ran one of the two largest and most prominent AI centers in the world for many, many years. Because Rodney witnessed and shaped so much of the history of both robotics and AI, we'll spend a bit more time than usual talking about past decades. That's probably a bit more than 20 minutes of our conversation. I've included it in part because it's great storytelling, but mainly because it's important to understand the many false starts and great leaps forward that these fields have both endured, as this will bring a much more nuanced perspective on their present and future. And that future is the subject of the bulk of our conversation. For one thing, we'll discuss self-driving cars as they comprise the very intersection of robotics and artificial intelligence. Rodney considers the forecast made by many leaders in this field to be irrationally optimistic. Those who want their self-driving cars immediately won't necessarily like this, but you have to respect that Rodney's own predictions are very concrete and verifiable. Also, he makes them in writing and affixes them with hard dates, something that many futurists lack the courage to do. Rodney also diverges from fashionable narratives about the interplay between employment and automation. To paraphrase one of his blog posts, he's not at all worried that there won't be enough jobs to go around. Instead, he's concerned that there won't be enough labor available to do the jobs that will need to be done even after many more revolutionary strides are made in robotics and other automation. Yes, really. Thirdly, Rodney's far less concerned about super AI risks than many of tech's most prominent commentators. If your job description includes freaking out about AI risks, and I guess mine kind of does, you may find his perspective to be frustratingly sanguine. On the other hand, if you prefer that humanity not perish at the hands of amoral and genocidal AI overlords, you might find his arguments reassuring, particularly given the authority and experience that they're based on. Now, before we start the interview, I'd like to give another appreciative shout out to the people who are backing this show on Patreon. As I record this, we're starting to close in on 150 of you. Most people are backing the show at the $5 a month level, which gets you access to an additional roundup of thoughts and analysis from me on each new interview. And I'm really enjoying making those recordings. They're running 12 to 15 minutes, and they let me go into quite a bit more speculative depth on the topics covered in the interviews. But a lot of people have supported the show at the $1 a month level, which I really appreciate as well, because that means it's probably a bit of a stretch for you to back me in this work, but you're going out of your way to make a statement to me anyway, so thank you. And I'll add that to my astonishment, a couple of people are giving $100 a month to the show. And of course, I appreciate that immensely. It's a really strong statement to me about how much you value this content and want to see it continue. It's also a realistic acknowledgement that most people, for various reasons, won't be backing the show. So to those of you with the financial comfort and generosity to offset that, thank you very kindly. Now, penciling things out from here, though I do consider this to be an amazing and highly flattering start, I'm not sure if Patreon will get to the point of covering all my expenses, plus New York City minimum wage, by the end of June. And if you're curious about the details behind that calculation, I laid them out at the beginning of the last episode, and you can check that. And this is not a shock or a disappointment. Statistics over a span of decades show that usually one to maybe on the top end, 
5% of listeners will support media like this on a voluntary basis. This is true of NPR, it's true of PBS, and it's consistent with what I've heard from other podcasters. And we're already at about 1%, which is to say about 150 people out of the 15,000 people who are downloading this podcast on a regular basis. And I only started asking for your support less than a month ago, so I consider that to be fast, impressive, and flattering. Now, for those of you who don't see yourselves becoming patrons, there's a second and highly complimentary way to help make this show financially sustainable, which is to help me increase its audience. And what's nice about this is that it happens to align precisely with my actual motivation for creating the show, which is certainly not to get rich, but rather to reach as many neurons as possible with information, thoughts, and perspective that I think are important. Now, obviously, this podcast is absolutely not for everybody. You need an omnivorously curious mind, plus the patience, and also, I guess I'd say the mental ambition to listen to people whose words are as dense with thought and complex information as those of my guests. And that's certainly not everybody. But contrary to popular belief, I actually think a lot of people out there crave high-density thought, and I'd love to reach as many of them as I can with this work. And there's actually a tie between that and financial sustainability because I've been doing some digging and I'm pretty sure that with an audience of about 50,000 listeners, 5-0, I'd be able to make this thing work between a balance of ad support and patrons. So that means roughly tripling the audience from here and again by the end of June is kind of what I'm giving myself, which does sound like a big lift, but it's probably a lot easier to go from 15,000 listeners to 50,000 than it was to go from zero listeners to even 500. I mean, the show's audience has already tripled again and again and again since I launched it in August. And the somewhat shocking fact that there's already 15,000 of you tells me that there's surely a lot more people like you who simply haven't heard of this incredibly obscure and unpromoted podcast of mine. So here's what I'd like to request. If you have 30 seconds to spare, that's less than 1% of the duration of one of these episodes, please consider tweeting the show or talking about it on Facebook or any other social media channel, either the current episode or any one of the 20 plus episodes in the archive that really spoke to you, none of which are out of date because I carefully designed these shows to have a very long shelf life. So if you really enjoyed the sweeping introduction to the world of cryptocurrency that it did with Coinbase founder Fred Ursum back in December, push that out there. Or if you're as fascinated as I am by Fermi's paradox, which is the question of why we've seen no signs of intelligent aliens despite the vastness and profound age of the universe, push episode eight out there, etc. And it'll actually be really easy to do this because I've tweeted each episode of the show with a few words, plus a graphic that does a decent job of conveying what the episode's all about. And I tweet about virtually nothing else, although I occasionally whine about the New York subway. So if you go to my Twitter feed, which is Rob underscore Reed, that's R-E-I-D, with minimal scrolling, you'll be able to find the graphic and the tweet that summarizes any episode that you happened to like. And you can, of course, copy and paste that into your Facebook feed as well or any other social media feed, and I'd highly appreciate it. Now, to illustrate why I can really use the help... Twitter is my main social media channel, and I typically get retweeted a lot less than 10 times on average per episode, probably less than five times for most. So I'm essentially reaching nobody on social media. I just don't have many followers. So if a bunch of you could be moved to push me out there, you'll almost certainly get me in front of way more people than I've managed to reach on my own since starting this thing in August. That is a literal fact. And in fact, I'm sure a few of you could do this single-handedly, perhaps in less than a minute. So if you're willing to spare 30 seconds, please do consider doing that. Now, if you got more like a minute to help get the word out, my gut tells me that if you write your own introduction to your retweet or to your Facebook post about why you think this show in general or a given episode is worth listening to, your own nuanced opinion will matter far more to the people who trust you and follow you than a simple repost. And however you feel like spreading the news, please do, whether it's social media, email, mentioning it over dinner, telling the folks on your hall if you live in a dorm, again, please do. Um, I'll wrap this appeal up by saying it feels like a very attainable goal to get this to an economically viable audience. Literally, if each of you know two people 
who enjoy this show or are likely to enjoy this show will get from 15,000 to almost 50,000 people very, very quickly. And by the way, just as a couple of people were in a position to make much larger donations than I ever expected or asked for, I'm sure at least a couple of you have real megaphones, like followers numbering in the tens of thousands or even more, or some other kind of platform. And if people in your situation spread the word, that could really, really move the needle quickly. So in case you're wondering about my cunning long-term plan for all this, if I can get to 50,000 listeners by the end of June, I think I'll be able to pay the bills with a combination of non-odious advertising plus Patreon. And after that, I'm almost positive there will be a way to make a commercial free feed available to patrons so you're not exposed to both. And for non-patrons, hopefully you'll view a light commercial load as being a reasonable cost in exchange for the show continuing into July and beyond. So let's see if we can get there, and I'll keep you posted on how things are growing or not growing over the coming weeks. And with that, it's time for our interview with Rodney Brooks. So Rodney, I'm delighted that we're able to catch up during one of our brief overlaps here in San Francisco. Thanks so much for making time. Happy to be here. I'd like to start by going briefly through some of your early background. You grew up on one of the southern fringes of the inhabited world, didn't you? Yeah, from where I grew up, the next thing south was actually Antarctica. I grew up on the south coast of Australia, and at the time it was actually the third biggest city in the country, Adelaide. Back then, you literally would get your tech news by steamship. Yes, we'd get mostly British magazines, and they would show up three months after the date on the cover because they came by ship. And then you were obsessed with robotics and computing from a very, very early age, correct? You had a garden shed where you built all these things? Yeah, my mother actually bought me two magazine-like books. that were a series called the How and Why Wonder Books, which were American books. She bought me two in 1961, one on electricity and one on computers and giant brains. I still have those to this day. And from that, I learned how to build little simple electrical circuits with materials I had, nails, the metal from a vegetable can, wires, light bulbs from flashlights, and batteries. And I started building ores and ands, and not was a little harder. Not tricky. And started building little circuits from a pretty early age, around nine or ten. We've all heard about the budding young entrepreneur in the back shed. But you're building computers and also nascent robots, if I'm not mistaken, in the 1960s. So maybe a decade before we normally associate with this activity. I wasn't so good mechanically. The first time I got a robot to actually move was more like 1970. Oh, much later. To be fair. (laughs) Actually, by 1971, I was actually building printed circuit boards where I would etch them. I found a source of surplus transistors by that time and was building circuits with hundreds of transistors. And then university in 1972. Yes. And so I started at a university called Flinders University in Adelaide. It was six years old when I went there. And all the math faculty were refugees from Czechoslovakia, from the Prague Spring. Oh, 1968. Where they had fled. Yeah. And so I ended up getting a classical Eastern European mathematics education. In my four years there, I took 41 classes. One was in chemistry, Mm -hmm. one was in physics, and 39 were in mathematics. That's a huge amount of math. Yeah. Now, this would have been well before there was a computer science department there, of course. Right. There was no computer science department. The mainframe for the university was a 16-kilobyte IBM 1130. It had a megabyte disk. It had four full-time operators running it. Wow. And you punched your cards and put them in, and 24 hours later, you'd get a printout. Wonderfully for me, wonderfully, Jaroslav Kautsky, who taught numerical analysis, recognized in me something and arranged for me to have that computer to myself for 12 hours every Sunday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. You talk about the 10,000 hours, that was my 10,000 hours. Yeah, you probably had more compute resources than almost anybody on the continent at that point, having 12 hours of a dedicated mainframe like that, right? Yeah, and I had access to everything. So naturally, uh, when you were done with all that, there was nowhere to go but Silicon Valley. Not that anybody knew what Silicon Valley was yet. Silicon Valley. I knew that I had to come to the United States. Yeah. And the three important places in the U.S. for computer science at the time, and still largely today, were... MIT, Carnegie Mellon, and Stanford. Hasn't changed. So I applied to those three. Yeah. Did not get into MIT. Ah. Did get into Carnegie Mellon Mm -hmm. and to Stanford. Yeah. So I went to the library, 
found an atlas and looked up where <laughs> Pittsburgh and Palo Alto were, and Palo Alto was closer to Australia. So that's what I chose. That cannot be denied. And then in 1977, when you came over, describe the state of robotics at that time, specifically how many mobile robots were in the world in 1977? As far as I know, unless there were some in the Soviet Union, which we didn't know about, but that anyone knew of, there were three. There was a robot called Hilaire at Lars in Toulouse, France. There was a rover at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. And there was something called the CART, C-A-R-T. The CART. The CART. Definite article. So it, wasn't, it was not an acronym. It was just the CART. At Stanford AI Lab. Well, given that one of the three robots was there, it was obviously a very good choice that you did make versus Carnegie Mellon. My thesis was not on that mobile. It was not on the cart, but it was there. I helped Hans Moravec with his experiments as yep. he was finishing up his PhD thesis. I read somewhere you were experimenting with a 28-hour day. Yeah, one summer, because I was always getting up later and later, I decided, okay, I'm just going to go for it. I will do six 28-hour cycles a week. That way I'll be able to get to certain social events on Saturday nights. Because Hans was working with the cart late at night, and you were on your bizarre 28-hour cycle. So you had a lot of time helping him out with the cart stuff. He would try to do his runs from 10 or 11 p.m. till about 5 a.m., when no one else was using the machine yeah. largely, so he'd get enough computer oomph to run his cart in real time so that it could move a meter every 15 minutes. And it would scan the floor and make sure it wasn't bumping into things, and it would take 15 minutes to say, okay, I'm ready for my next meter. Ready next for my meter. next one meter. My next one meter dash. Yeah. Yes. So it is intriguing that you did come to robotics when it was virtually non-existent. What was the state of AI at that point? I know the term had been around for over 20 years because there had been that Dartmouth seminar in the 50s. What was the state of the field? The Dartmouth Conference of 1956 was initiated by John McCarthy, and John McCarthy was the director of the Stanford AI Lab when I got there. Very remote figure. And he had founded the AI Lab at MIT as well, correct? Well, along with Marvin Minsky, and then he left very soon after that, and he came to Stanford and founded the Stanford AI Lab. But there were little pockets of AI, apart from those big three, you know, Berkeley had a little bit, some Canadian universities, but there were labs, they weren't departments. departments. And then John McCarthy, he had co-founded the AI Lab at MIT, he founded your lab, he named the field, he's the one who coined the term artificial intelligence. And so you were learning from the founder of the field, or one of the two or three founders oh, of the yeah, field. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Everyone knew everyone. There were maybe 250 AI researchers in the world, and everyone knew everyone. And what was the state and significance of the language LISP at that point? Well, LISP had been developed by John McCarthy when he was at MIT, and then there were different versions of it had been built everywhere. And LISP was the standard language that everyone was using. So LISP was the language of AI at that time, and for quite some time after that. For a long time after that, yeah. I haven't hacked on my own version of LISP since yesterday afternoon. Since yesterday afternoon. It's been that long. <laughs> so it is still a vibrant... It I is, still use it, a version that I built in the early 1990s. I'm still tweaking it. That's fantastic. So this was the language of AI, and you ended up founding or co-founding a company called Lucid that was really core to its proliferation, wasn't it? Yeah. At MIT, they had started building special purpose workstations to run Lisp. Specifically for Lisp. They were called Lisp machines, all built by hand. There were about 19 or 20 of them wow. at that point at the AI lab when I got there. All built by hand. Yeah, built there. And then two companies spun off, one called Lisp Machine Inc. and one called Symbolics. I remember Symbolics boxes. They were dedicated machines. Yeah. So back at Stanford... Just before I had left, I had advised a good buddy of mine that his idea was stupid, dumb idea, and that workstations were not the future, mainframes were the future. But Andy Bechtelsheim went ahead and founded Sun Microsystems anyway. Boy, did he. And so I knew about those workstations. They were not custom-built processors. They used standard chips. And it seemed to me that Symbolics was every machine was custom-designed, the CPU was custom-designed. They couldn't put as much engineering oomph into it as the chips which were used for other workstations, other things. There was going to be much more engineering going in. I decided that even though at that point Lisp in hardware had an advantage over Lisp in software, Lisp in software would ultimately win out. So just to clarify for those who aren't familiar with this era, Sun and several other companies created this new category of computers called workstations which were way more powerful than PCs, but like PCs, could be used for lots of different things. 
And you believed, correctly as it turns out, that computers that could only write Lisp would be overwhelmed in the marketplace by workstations, which could do that and countless other things. So you created a software Lisp package that could be used on a diversity of computers, including those of Sun. So anyway, back to what happened. So when I joined the faculty at Stanford in 1983, one of the first things I did while I was writing a book on Lisp for my undergraduate course, while I had my first baby, I also wrote a software Lisp system for the Sun workstations. Mm -hmm. And middle of 84, I was leaving Stanford and going back to MIT. And a bunch of other people saw my Lisp running on those workstations and said, we could start a company building software version of Lisp. So I teamed up with them, and just to get the first funding and get bootstrapped, they decided, you know, Brooks's compiler, it's sort of hacky, but we'll use it to start with. And so a week after we incorporated the company, got funding, I left, went to MIT to join the faculty for the next few years while being a junior professor. And pretty much every morning, I would have a 40 megabyte cartridge tape ready for the Federal Express person who would come and take the cartridge tape sometimes bring the newspaper in as yeah. they came and ship that across the country on what I fondly called Federal Express Net. Yes. <laughs> and then there was a uh, guy at Lucid. One of his jobs was to take my code and integrate it into the build system. He was uh, not exactly complimentary about everything. He called my compiler Bertha. Uh-huh. Brooks extremely ran the twisted hack assortment. Okay, yeah. And ultimately, when the company failed, he went off and got another job. He became employee number one at a little place up in Seattle called Amazon. Oh. Shell Caffin. Nicely done. He did very, very well. Now, with Lucid, you ended up creating Lisp that would run on 19 different platforms because there were many, many different dialects of Unix back in the well, days. Well, it was many different dialects of processor. Right. It was great that I was at MIT because there were so many spin-outs from Digital Equipment Corporation. That all had their own architecture. There was Prime, there was Apollo, there were a bunch of others. And then there was DEC itself, which had multiple architectures. Did you run on MIPS? Yeah, we ran on MIPS. So you ran on Silicon Graphics then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my first job in tech was at Silicon Graphics. You ended up betting on the workstation platform at exactly the right time. During the great thriving of Lisp, I imagine the vast majority of people who were using it were using it on Lucid. Is that correct? Yeah, it was the big seller. There were some free versions around, but we were much better. And then in the midst of all this, you're having an academic career, obviously, at MIT, and eventually you were running the AI lab, correct? Yeah, I had started out building custom mobile robots during the 80s, teaching Lisp, and in 97, I became director of the lab. So very foundational moments, clearly for both robotics and for AI, and in the midst of this, in 1990, you founded iRobot, correct? In 1990, I founded iRobot. Lucid was still around for a couple more years, but along with Colin Angle and Helen Grainer, Colin was my student. Helen, I was her registration officer, which meant I had to approve her course selection. We thought robots must be important, so let's start a company. We didn't have a business model. We started the company, and I was sort of annoyed at VCs after the Lucid experience, so we decided not to take any external funding. We decided to bootstrap. Really? I didn't know that. We bootstrapped from 1990 to 1998 before we took any external funding. And we would sell robots before we had built them with 50% up front. And that was how we financed the building. Of the Got way. it. I know you've written elsewhere. You had 14 failed business models, yes, correct? Yes, Colin Angle, who's still the CEO. Oh, is he? He says it's the only job he's had besides camp counselor <laughs> as a teenager. <laughs> he's got a slide where he shows the 14 business models that failed. Including, what was it, Baby Jade? No, uh, My Real Baby. My Real Baby, which was a a robotic doll, right? A robotic doll. Humanoid. Humanoid. We partnered with... um, Hasbro, right? Hasbro, and we sold them. Right around 98, we had 30 employees with six divisions, (laughs) working in six different areas, downhole oil well robots, military robots, toys, etc. Got it. And um, I personally learned how to do low-cost manufacturing. I was the one who went to Taipei, spent time there with various people, but we soon discovered that we had to show them at Toy Fair and other people would see our toy and copy it. Well, well, I got to commend you. I I caught some video online and you did manage to create a truly creepy doll. It was creepy. Really creepy. It was with Hasbro. Yes, of course. But what I'm proudest of there is the the low-cost manufacturing. When we started, the prototype had six motors in the face. When we shipped it, it had one motor and you couldn't tell the difference. 
Well, after 14 failed business models, you suddenly had not one but two hits in the same year, 2002. We had two commercial hits and a wild publicity hit. 2002, we were seen by millions of people live with a robot in the Great Pyramid looking into a cavern that hadn't been seen before, drilling a hole, and the big reveal, what was in the cavern? Nothing. Nothing, yes. Yeah. But <laughs> no, I could guess. I lived in Cairo for a while, um, so I, I know what's in those caverns. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was early September 2002. September 18th, we released the Roomba. And earlier in the year, we had sent two of our military robots, pack bots, to Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan. Just two of them? Just two to start with. And what was the intended purpose of them at that point? The intended purpose and the use was to go look in caves. The big thing was, what are in the caves? Yeah. Where, where's everyone hiding? What's right. going on? And the 82nd, one of the first airborne said, we don't need no stinking robots. Until they got there and there was this black hole that they had to bend down to go in. And suddenly the idea of sending a robot in ahead of them with a camera feeding back what was in there seemed like a good idea before walking in there. And then ultimately, fast forward, there ended up being 6,500 packbots deployed throughout Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, is that right? Roughly that number. And they ended up being used for IEDs, not just yes. for caves, but for lots of other things. Oh, lots of other things, yeah. Their big use really was IEDs, improvised explosive devices. Yeah, yeah. So all those roadside bombs that if people remember the news reports, things blowing up on the side of the road. When we first went there, the U.S. military doctrine was to put someone in a bomb suit send them out with a stick to poke the bomb. That would be a lousy job. And then, obviously, the Roomba is a household name. There are 25 million of them in yeah, the world now? Yeah, it's not clear how many, but 800 million in revenue. Wow. You know, that's a lot of Roombas. Just yeah, that's a Roombas. lot of Roombas. That's 800 million a year that iRobot is doing right now. So tens of millions of Roombas out there, millions shipping every year. And comparing that to a world in which there were three mobile robots... Not all that long before. It feels good. But I tell you what the best feeling I have is in 2011, a week after the Fukushima disaster, we sent some robots, and those robots were used in the shutdown of the reactor. They were used. They yeah. were used. They're still there. Yeah. Still there. It was a, quite a good feeling to see that we had helped. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you saved the lives of countless soldiers as well. You just will never know how many lives yeah, you saved. Yeah, we would them. often get postcards saying, the yeah. robot saved my life, which the company has kept and has on display. And iRobot robots have cleaned pools, they've mowed lawns, they've cleaned floors. But then you ended up deciding to move on. Was it 2008 that you started Rethink Robotics? Yes, yeah, I did. And you also left academia at that point, correct? Yeah, I'd stepped down as lab director in 2007, and I was on sabbatical for a year. And I was still CTO of iRobot. September 1st, 2008, I took leave from MIT and I stepped down as CTO of iRobot. I stayed on the board for another three years and started a new company. And that is Rethink Robotics. And what did you feel that the world of robotics needed at that point that iRobot wasn't in a position to provide that this new company, this new platform? Yeah. So it came from two sets of experiences. I had been involved in manufacturing in China since the late 90s. We use contract manufacturers. We had noticed that after Golden Week, which is the Chinese New Year, the biggest migration of humans in the world, we would have trouble staffing as many lines because not so many people would come back. Ooh, so there was huge churn then. There was churn. Yeah. And, you know, that was getting weird. And then simultaneously, as director of CSAIL, we were working with a bunch of Taiwan-based companies. So we started a lot of joint research projects with them, and they would tell me about their labor problems in mainland China. Labor problems in There's mainland just China? Not, just not enough people. In the late 90s? When no, this is the early 2000s. Early 2000s. 2003, 2004, 2005. But still at a time when I think... When everyone else thought, ah, oh, there's infinite labor in China. Yeah, I mean, I remember very, very sophisticated people saying, Western China is going to export deflation to the rest of the world for a decade because there's so many folks but there were already labor shortages. One person who said to me at the time, you know, in the old days, we would put a little three inch by five inch card outside a factory saying we want labor tomorrow and there'd be a line around the block. Now we advertise on TV, we have scholarship programs, we do this, we do that, we still can't get enough people. So I started hearing that. At the same time, I was in an advisory group to John Deere. So I visited just about every John Deere factory in the United States. And what did I hear there? Our manufacturing population is aging. There are no young people in Dubuque, Iowa anymore. We have to hang on to our workforce. We can't replace them. And those who are in Dubuque don't want to go to work in the factory. No one aspires to be a factory worker. In the yeah. factory. And that's what happened in China, by the way. Not only did the standard of living go up, but education went up. 
That was an aspiration at one point. It's not an aspiration now. So I'm seeing the U.S. coming labor shortages in manufacturing, despite people thinking all the jobs have been stolen away. And I see them not being fillable in China. So I thought, okay, we need robots in factories. There were robots in factories, in car factories. But if you went into a car factory then, or you go into a car factory today, there are two worlds. There's the world of the body shop, where there's welding and robots and no people. Dante's Inferno. Sort of the nobody shop. The nobody there are no shop. humans in there because it's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. Yeah. And it's been automated up the wazoo. It's an expensive process. And then there's final assembly where there's very few robots. And it's all people. It's all people. Robots and people didn't mix. Because of danger. Well, two reasons. One was the danger. The other is if there are people around, they're messy and things move. And the way automation worked... We know exactly where every piece is. We keep track of it. No surprises. No surprises. So in looking at Chinese factories and looking at shop floors of deer plants and others, I thought what we needed were robots that could intermingle with people with no cages. Yep. Because if you're going to replace all the people, it's an enormous capital expense. Then it locks you into high volumes. You can't do it in low volumes. Yes. Yeah. And all the robots were literally behind cages to yeah. protect humans from them. Yeah. Or one way of looking at it in some factories, there are a few cages that humans can, can be go in into amongst yeah. <laughs> yeah. the robots. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there were two things. Make it so that it was safe to be close to a robot and make it so the robot could adapt to things not being in precise locations. So a person to just push up a cart of parts next to the robot yep. without having to get it down to, and this is the normal number, one-tenth of a millimeter precision. That's what you needed for a traditional industrial robot. That's yeah. the number today. So tell us about Baxter and Sawyer, what you created. So we started building robots which used a technology that had been developed at the AI lab. Gil Pratt and Matt Williamson, who had been a student of mine, they had developed something called a series elastic actuator. And that series elastic actuator lets you know how much force you're applying on a joint and measure any external forces. On every joint. On every joint. And there's a lot of mathematics around it to make it work, but we put those into our robots. So instead of going for rigidity, we had softness. Mm -hmm. There's a spring in there. The spring actually absorbs energy very quickly because springs can compute faster than anything. But then the computation clicks in at a 1,000 hertz and dissipates the energy in a few milliseconds. So it's a combination of software and hardware mm -hmm. and exquisite control of forces. So our robots, if you go up to them and you get in the way of them, even if they're moving fast, they realize in milliseconds they've hit something they didn't expect. They just they stop. stop. So please don't do this out there in the real world. <laughs> but I put my head in front of our robots and have them hit, and they're safe. Yep. So there was that aspect. But then using that force perception, when you or I – put a nut on a bolt. We don't locate that to within a tenth of a millimeter and then go and put the nut in exactly that position, which a traditional robot would have to do. Instead, we go there and we tilt the nut slightly and put it on the edge of the bolt and then tilt it over and then start turning and feel whether it catches. We do it by perception and proprioception. Yes. And we use these springs in the joints, series elastic actuators, with all this computation. To replicate that. To do that. Now, if you go into an electronics manufacturing plant in China, 30% of the labor is taking circuit boards, putting them into a tester where there are alignment pins, making sure it settles down on the alignment pins, shut the tester, run the tests, and on a screen it goes red or green. Yeah. So our robots can use exactly the same fixturing that people use, and our robots have cameras in them, and they look at the screen and see whether it goes red or green. You said in one interview that I heard that basically for a lot of people in factories, what they're doing is they're waiting. They're tending to a very, very expensive piece of capital equipment. Because it's expensive, you don't want any downtime. So they're not allowed to go to the bathroom. They're not allowed hours. to go to the bathroom. They need to feed things in in a precise way. And then they need to wait for the light. They might be sitting there for 10 or 15 minutes because that equipment is so expensive that you do not want to have the downtime. So you can take over jobs like that. I know because I've seen the demonstrations, it's incredibly easy to train the robots because you're moving their arms in space. Yeah, although we're not teaching them a trajectory. You're teaching them a task, right? You're teaching them a task. Like yeah, which is an important differentiation. So come to some place and now close your fingers until you feel such and such a force. Yes. And now if the coordinate system varies, then either find the coordinate system by force or we can say use vision here. And there's a screen which 
looks like the head of the robot. And we actually have eyes on there by default when it's running, so it can look surprised when something is too weird. And it also looks where it's about to reach. It's the same as a human worker. They don't do things that surprise you because they look before they reach. And we don't need to train the workers about this. They pick it up. A really interesting anecdote is when you went to Automate, which is a major robotics trade show. Enormous trade show in the, in the McCormick Center in Chicago. In Chicago. 2013. There were no uncaged robots. None at all. None at all. And we said, we want to have our robot uncaged. And they were like, oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not safe. So our VP of product management said, look, it is safe. It is safe. So he went with the safety people to our robot and then let the robot bash him in the chest time after time after time. <laughs> the safety people for the trade show. Okay. Just this once. Yeah. You know, you've shown that it's safe. One uncaged robot. One uncaged line. robot. Yeah. That was 2013. I was there last year, 2017. There must have been 2,000 uncaged robots on that floor. Thousands of uncaged in just four years. It's just changed. That's amazing. Yeah. And then there's also this thing with PLCs and connecting to other automated equipment. If you're going to do that with a traditional robot, you need to start talking to this infrastructure, right, called a PLC. Can you give us a quick description of what a PLC is? Because it's an amazing legacy. Yeah, so programmable logic controllers. They were an invention of a company in Bedford, Massachusetts in 1968. And they were amazing. Before that, controlled industrial processes with electromagnetic relays. Now, a lot of people probably never heard of them, but it's a coil wire round around a metal core that pulls down a little lever and that makes and breaks contacts. And you hear a click and everything you else. You hear a click and yep. that's what phone systems were built on. That was the technology through to the 60s. Phone systems were not then built on computers after that. They were built on special purpose electronics and PLCs. The PLCs in all their specs, there are two abstractions that they use. One is the coil there are no real coils, but that's one of the abstractions. And the other abstraction is a 16-bit number. So they're still mimicking, to this day, PLCs still mimic these mechanical relays from decades and decades yeah, ago. Yeah, and then it gets worse. You say, oh, well, that's just the old companies. No. When I was writing a blog post in September, I went to Tesla's website to look at their Bay Area factory just to check. And there they had ads for PLC engineers for the manufacturing system for Tesla's. So the automated infrastructure is old. Yeah. It is old. And around that same time, I was with one of the major suppliers of this technology. I was talking about our cadence of software updates. You know, every three months, we try to have a new version of the software. They said, yeah, we try to do three versions every 20 years. <laughs> um, anyway, so we realized that this was a friction point for people who hadn't had automation before. They're bringing a robot. Now they're going to learn about PLCs. They're going to learn about this 60-year-old technology, 50-year-old technology. And so we made it so that for a lot of things, not every single case of using PLCs, but for a lot of the common cases where you want to connect a robot to other machines, use the same behavior trees on the robot to take over the role of what a traditional automation engineer would have done with PLCs. Got it. We got rid of them. So that's how I like to think about it. I like to think about going to our customers and seeing what is the friction of deploying the robot. And we've seen many pieces of friction. PLCs was one of them. Yeah. Buy the robot, then how the hell do we connect it? When you think about the near to intermediate future of robotics, what do you see on the horizon that maybe most folks would not see? I am worried that we will not have enough assistance for elder care. Now, I want to be clear on this. I'm not talking about companion robots. That's not what I think is important. But if you look at the demographic inversion, we see it happening in Japan. They've got so nuts. many more older people than the younger people already. They're going to 30% of their population over 65 within a few years, and it's going to get worse. And the number of working people who support a retired person has famously gone from double digits to very low single digits in many countries. Yeah, yeah. and it's going to continue, and it's going to continue in the U.S. Why in the U.S.? Well, we've relied on immigrant labor forever. We're not encouraging immigration anymore, which is bad for farms, and it's going to be really bad for elder care. And the baby boomers are about to get really old, and there's a lot of them. And I'm not saying that you want the robots to be companions, but what is important to people is their independence and their dignity. The first thing that is bad for older people is when they can no longer drive. So I think not self-driving cars, because I'm skeptical of how quickly they're coming, but the driver assist features mm -hmm. that we now are putting in our modern car are important. Yeah. are important because they let the elderly drive safely longer. Their standard of living goes down incredibly when they have to go to managed care. 
if they can stay in their house longer, they're mentally fine. But what if they can no longer get into or out of bed by yeah. themselves? In my mother's case, that was a deciding factor when she went to managed care because she couldn't do it by herself anymore. But what if you had a, a device that the person can talk to? We've now got the speech systems with Amazon Echo, Google Home. Grab me here, do this, do that, and let the person maintain their independence of getting into and out of bed by a robot that can deal with the soft body of a person, not hurt them, use understanding of forces to manipulate the person under their command. That's something that I have a personal understanding for because I have a close family member. We have 24-hour care. That is a one-to-one -one mapping of a caregiver to a care receiver. And it's partly because this person does struggle to get in and out of bed and struggles to get in and out of the bathroom and so forth. But were it not for that, until very recently, would have no trouble living independently. And we can't map people one for one, caregiver to care recipient, and also pushing lots and lots of people to manage care because two or three relatively simple tasks, it's a really big deal. How long do you think it will be before we have robots that can help with these very intimate, relatively straightforward, but when you get down on a biomechanical level, very complicated functions like assisting in and out of bed? Is that a, within a decade, do you think? We're starting to see significant research in Japan. Now when you get into a traditional robot trade show, which is full of industrial robots, there'll be a whole section of research institutes showing off their not quite ready for prime time yet robots to do these sorts of tasks. Oh. So they're working like hell on it. They're trying to create the market at the same time. We see a few places in the US that hasn't been much research money going into it. I'm having dinner with some entrepreneurs tomorrow, as it happens, who are doing something. I don't know what they're doing. They probably won't tell me exactly, but I know it's something to do with elder care and it's yeah. robots and they're people who have a track record of doing stuff. So we're starting to see it just at the edge happening. Now, whether that's going to be ready in 10 years, the mass market, that's why I'm worried. It Got may it. be 20 years, it may be 25 years. But I think we'll see a flow of venture capital and other things into this in the five to 10 year time frame, It will be a colossal need and a colossal market and markets abhor vacuums. So hopefully there will be radical and unexpected progress there. Now you mentioned self-driving cars. That is the very intersection of AI and robotics, which are two things that you were almost foundationally early into. You wrote a fabulous blog post on the first of this year in which you made dozens of predictions dated with years by which things in robotics, self-driving, AI, and so forth can happen. And first of all, I just want to salute you for having the courage to do this. Most people, even self-proclaimed futurists, tend to make their predictions vague and leave them highly undated. And you boldly put years on pretty much everything that you made. Now, a few of your dated predictions pertaining to self-driving cars, you said no earlier than 2022 do you expect a driverless taxi service in a major U.S. city, and this is a critical factor, dedicated pickup and drop-off points in restricted areas, so highly restricted taxi service. You didn't even see that happening until 2022 or more likely thereafter. Yeah, I think we'll see people claiming to have demos. Yes. They will not be real. It reminds me of a great tweet that I saw about a year ago about San Francisco, actually. The passengers knew they were getting into a driverless Uber because there were two people in the front seat instead of one. <laughs> but I think that's the point. We say there are driverless cars doing all these things, but they're not really. You know, in Phoenix, there's going to be some things, but whether that's real or demo mode is a different question. And you were very specific in your predictions. You were saying an actual functioning taxi service with lots of restrictions, designated pickup and drop-off points, restricted part of the city 2022. And I think you said no earlier than 2032 will we see a taxi service with arbitrary pickup and drop-off in a major metropolitan area. Do people in the field consider these to be timid suggestions? You get pushback from people in the industry I don't on this. get pushback from heads of major automobile companies. I don't get pushback from heads of places that are really trying to do it for real. I get pushback from people in Silicon Valley who think that everything's just going to happen quickly. They see Waymo cars driving around Mountain View and think that's general. And these would be investors, journalists, and tech bros. And tech bros. Got it. Why do you think these people and others are overestimating the rate of development in this field? I think they're making a bunch of mistakes, but I asked them, when did the first car drive down a freeway for 10 miles at 50 miles an hour? They know that, that the Google cars did that 
2004 or 2005. It was actually done in Germany in 1987. Wow. When are we going to get the first car, hands off the steering wheel, feet off the pedals, drive coast to coast in the U.S.? Yeah, well, it actually happened in 1995 with the uh, NavLab project from Carnegie Mellon University. So my point is, everyone thinks, oh, this has just arrived, this is going to happen quickly. It's been around a long time to get to where we are. I have now demonstrated to them that their scale is wrong. Their start point is wrong. It's taken a lot longer to get to where we are. And that's a really important subtlety, because when you look at a Waymo car today and you think all this started four years ago, it seems so rapid. But when you realize this started in 1987, it's a completely different scale. Yeah. Anyway, so there's that point. The second point is everyone's concentrating on the driving. That it can drive here. It can go on this freeway. It can do this. And I think that's the easy problem. So I've heard major manufacturers of cars, lawyers say, our car will never break the law. Well, in my neighborhood in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I cannot drive anywhere, any day without breaking the law. Give me an example. I have to cross a double yellow line every day. I cannot drive around. Everything's so crowded. And there's also a lot of one-way streets where you are. There's a lot of one-way streets, and about every three weeks, I have to drive the wrong way on a one-way street because there is a temporary blockage there. And it's the only way out. It's the only way out. I could sit and wait for six hours. Literally. For the road workers to clean up and leave. So if you've got a self-driving car that will never break the law, suddenly you've got a very unhappy passenger who's sitting there for six hours. Right. Well, these self-driving cars are probably going to have a speech interface. Is the passenger allowed to tell the car to break the law? Mm. And what if the passenger is a 14-year-old that has been sent to soccer practice by their mum? Is the 14-year-old allowed to tell the car, override what the car wants to do? Somebody without a driver's license, yeah. Exactly. Or what if it's a dementia patient? Are they allowed to? Dementia patients often have very strong opinions about things, which are wrong. So I think there's all sorts of issues. Whenever you get picked up by an Uber in a very urban environment or a lift, they often pull into a no-parking zone and stop. They pull into a bus zone and stop. And you and the driver know that's okay. Yeah. But that's a necessity. You're dead right. Almost every Uber Lyft I've gotten into, there is some tiny violation of the law that's going on. That doesn't really bother anybody. It's bother the way anybody. it works, but it's a violation of the law. Now, are the cars allowed to violate the law on their own? And where's the limit? And then what happens if something goes wrong once, then they get sued for violating the law. I mean, I guess that car industry had to deal with this when they decided to allow cruise controls to be set for 75 miles per hour back whenever cruise control came out. But that's a lot different. Still the driver in the car who's the one who's liable. Who said it, precisely. So is the passenger in a mobility as a service car, are they the one that's liable now? So I think there's all sorts of issues. And you can say, oh, that's just details. But that's what takes a long time for things to happen. Well, there's dozens of those details or hundreds of them. Hundreds of those details. Let alone the fact that driving most places in the US is very different from driving in Mountain View or Phoenix. Yeah, Driving in the East Coast, Driving in a highly congested city, very different style of driving. There's many, many more problems, but it's the social interaction. And then there's the pedestrians. In a crowded urban environment, such as I always refer to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Or all of Manhattan. Or or all all of Manhattan. There is an interaction between people and drivers all the time. Social interaction. All the time. At every intersection. Whose turn is it to go? You're catching each other's eyes. You're making sure people are paying attention. Yeah. Yeah, Even at night, in a highly lit area, you're interacting with the piece of people in the car. Well, what if that's a mobility as a service car, which doesn't have a passenger in it to get angry, and you know that for liability reasons, it ain't going to hit you. Now, you don't have to be polite to it anymore. Why be polite to that car with no person in it? Just step out in front of it. Or if you're a kid, hey, let's go tease some cars. Yeah. It'll be the fun game. Car teasing would actually be kind of fun if you're a kid, maybe even as an adult now that I think of it. And these are the sorts of things that aren't in the algorithms. Right. Now, the car is pulling up to an intersection. Is that person chatting with their buddy on the corner, or are they about to want to walk across the road? And if there's a painted white line there, is it legally the responsibility of the car to stop and let the person go? But you have to make a judgment on what their intent is in the next second or so. Or if somebody's waving you down, is it a police officer? Is it somebody of some authority in an orange vest? Is it some kooky person? Is it a carjacking? And how do you make those distinctions? In San Francisco, there's often temporary handwritten no parking signs. All these little edge cases amount and mount and mount, and you start thinking that this is every single driving situation that we're in. I said all this sort of stuff in my blog, and someone said, oh, you just don't understand. There aren't going to be one-way streets anymore because all the cars are going to communicate with each other, and they're all going to decide the optimal routing so we won't have one-way streets, so problem solved. 
That may be in the year 2070, but there's a long time between now and then. So there's going to be a mixture of human drivers and self-driving cars for 20, 30, 40 years. It's got to be a slow, steady thing. The day the first self-driving car ships, there will not be any special lanes or regions for it. Silicon Valley, because of Facebook, Google, Twitter, are used to doing code pushes a few times a day, deploy a new version of the code, because the cost of deployment is almost zero. Because every time you fire up your browser, you go somewhere, the code downloads. That's very different when it's a piece of capital equipment. I've had two cars as an adult. I had a 1991 Nissan Sentra, and then I bought another car in 2003 that's still serving me very well. There'll be a lot of non-self-driving cars when the first ones get out there. And there's also these unbelievable opportunities for the 1% to misbehave. You had this great blog post that I think was a little bit playful, but you had this phrase, virtually parked cars. Right. Describe what a virtually parked car is. <laughs> this came from Cambridge again. I needed yeah. to jump into a UPS store. And there were no parking spots. And I thought, damn, if only Mike's car was self-driving, I could jump out. It could cruise up and down Mass Avenue. Be virtually parked, yes. Virtually parked by driving and then be ready for me. Yeah. And as soon as you get that capability, people are going to abuse it up the hill. Now, another argument against handing the steering wheel to an AI today is really top of mind for me because as I was driving over here, my brakes failed. But my steering continued to work. And I had to choose between running over a nun oh. <laughs> and two thieves that were on the other side of the road. And as I was confronting this... Is one nun worth two more thieves, yeah. than two Yeah, yeah, because it's two lives, but this person is probably a better person than the two thieves. And as I was confronting this difficult choice, it occurred to me that it'd be very hard for an AI to think through this incredibly common situation that most drivers confront on an almost daily basis. Okay, for those who are listening and don't realize I'm being playful, that certainly did not happen. But this is an instantiation of something called the trolley problem that a lot of people have given thought to. How would an AI choose between running over one nun or two thieves? And do we want to hand that problem over to a non-human uh, decider? What's your take on the trolley problem? My take on it is it's a great intellectual thought problem, but in practice, it doesn't happen to you. No, I've never faced this choice. Never faced it. Yeah. What happens when there's an accident coming is you're trying to put the brakes on as fast as you can. Yeah. And that's about all you can do. The only piece of practical advice I've ever been given about this is in driving in northern Maine. If a moose is crossing the road, yes. swerve towards its rear end because mm. it's going to keep going the direction it faces. Ah. That's about as much processing as you're going to do. But it is funny because when I've sat around with brilliant people in tech, brainstorming about this stuff over dinner, I've probably had five to 10, maybe 20 times as many discussions of the trolley problem as I have had of the problem that most pickups in ride shares involve double parking. Going from robotics or the convergence of AI and robotics to AI, you wrote a great post back in September called The Seven Deadly Sins of Predicting the Future of AI about cognitive distortions that people commonly fall into when they're thinking about the future of AI and also the risks that a hypothetical super AI might pose to us humans. And I'd like to start out with one that is called Amara's Law, which is that we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. Why is that significant and how does that play out when people think about AI? Yeah, well, we saw that with computers. In the 60s, people were worried that intelligent computers would decide that people were useless and launch nuclear missiles to kill all the people. We didn't have any computers in the 60s that were remotely capable of that. We still don't. You know, I'm a Trekkie. The original Star Trek, yeah, or even the next generation in the 90s. You look at what the computers were predicted to be doing in three or 400 years, and it looks laughable now. Oh, your interstellar travel, but the computer couldn't do things that any computer could do today. Exactly. Yeah. So in that case, certainly underestimating what the long term was. Yes, we've seen that. And I would say one thing for me that steered into my memory is mobile computing. I first moved into technology in 1994, went to Silicon Graphics, as I mentioned. Apple just released the Newton. All the really smart tech forward people in my company, which was almost all of them, were carrying around around something called a sharp wizard, which was a personal digital assistant. And at that point, although it was a little bit prior to prime time, I would certainly have guessed that within three or four years, there'd be portable devices that were at least as useful as Outlook. And I would have been off by a factor of several hundred percent. But there's no way I would have imagined that 
there would be well within my lifetime this supercomputer in my pocket that could summon cars and do all the crazy, insane stuff that we do with our smartphones. So people, I guess you would argue, are systematically overestimating how much AI will be able to do in the near term. Near term, I imagine, being what, decades or something well, like I that? Well, I think people are overestimating it in two years and three years. Oh, it's going to do everything. It's going to change everything. So the counter to this is yep. they are underestimating in the long term, but I think the time frame for the long term is also too short. I think it's going to be hundreds of years. Now, there's an interesting distortion here that harkens back to what we were talking about with self-driving. I think a lot of people are looking at AI and they're seeing these radical breakthroughs that we've had in the last few years with machine learning. And there's a sense that we've gone from zero to 90 miles per hour in a very small single digit number of years. I mean, just five years ago, identifying what's in a picture was something that would defeat any system. So seeing that in the real time that it's happened, the very low single digit number of years, one could certainly think, oh my God, this is going so rapidly, but you've been working in AI since the late 1970s and you know that its history goes back to the mid-1950s. So it's kind of like this starting point problem. Yeah, let's talk about deep learning. Deep learning is the one that has enabled so much. Machine learning in general is on a lot of people's tongues. I saw it in an NFL ad recently saying, we're going to bring machine learning to give you better diagnostics of players in real time with yeah. Amazon Cloud. So deep learning is based on a technology called neural nets, which depending on how you look, the first paper was 1943, McCulloch and Pitts, really became in the 60s, something that people were investigating. There's a famous book by Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert called Perceptrons, which analyzes those neural nets. And then in the late 70s to early 80s, there was a breakthrough algorithm called backpropagation, which let the weights that are in these things, which are sort of vaguely related to synapses in the brain, let those be updated from the results of an example. And backpropagation at the time, completely overestimated in the short term. Thought it was the big thing. Backpropagation is one of the key aspects of deep learning. And fairly soon people realized, okay, it can do certain things, can't do as much as we thought. Most people moved on. Then there were support vector machines. There were all sorts of other machine learning algorithms. The flavor of the decade, flavor of the decade. A few people, Jeff Hinton at Toronto University, Yann LeCun, who was there at that point, later moved to Bell Labs, later NYU, kept pushing on backpropagation. Then around 2012, it popped. Yann LeCun is chief scientist at Facebook now, runs an enormous lab worldwide for Facebook. Jeff Hinton is at Google and University of Toronto, and it performs better than anyone expected. It was viewed as, all oh, those guys, they're working on that old problem. They're good guys, they're making slow progress, but yeah, it's never really going to go anywhere. It was one of a hundred things like that. We had no idea that backpropagation was going to pop. We don't know whether any of those others are going to pop that way. In hindsight, there's no indication that it was going to be backpropagation, which was the one that popped, and there's no indication of how general it's going to be. Yeah. The people who are seeing it for the first time are saying, wow, this is fantastic. This and means, look how far it's come in four look years. Look how far it's come. Yeah. And I've had people, people that you have interviewed, people that you have interviewed, say, but, but, don't things happen on a regular basis? Shouldn't we expect the next one, the next one, the next one? We don't know. We don't know. We knew with Moore's Law that we were going to be able to continue to half the feature size on a fairly regular basis for a long time. We knew that was going to happen. People got trained to things getting exponentially better. And people think, well, that's how everything works. No, science doesn't work that way. Research doesn't work that way. And all of these things take a long time, like the self-driving cars. They don't just pop. It just doesn't come out of nowhere. And again, there's that time frame distortion that you pointed to with self-driving cars. I mean, even as somebody who's fairly sophisticated in the field, my perception is that deep learning has gone from zero to 60 in two or three years, but it's over many, many decades. And to quote something you wrote in one of your blog posts, many people seem to think we'll continue to see AI performance increase by equal multiples on a regular basis. But the deep learning success was 30 years in the making and it was an isolated event. Going back to your predictions, I think somewhat playfully you predicted by 2020, the popular press will start having stories that the era of deep learning is over. No earlier than 2021, VCs will figure out that for an investment to pay off, there needs to be something more than X plus deep learning equals profits. 
And then between 2023 and 2027, you predict the emergence of the generally agreed upon next big thing in AI beyond deep learning. I did say there'd be many pretenders to the throne. You look at the comments on my blog, lots of people said, I know what it is. It's my research. (laughs) Of course. One of them will eventually be right. So that's Amara's Law. Now, the next one, Imagining Magic, also harkens back to one of your favorite quotable sources, in this case, Arthur C. Clarke, who said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So how might that lead to a cognitive distortion as people think about where AI is going and also about superintelligence risk? Yeah, so we haven't seen any superintelligence. So we have no prototypes. So if you imagine it exists, if it's indistinguishable from magic, then it can do anything. So the example I like to use is, suppose we had a time machine, why not? And we transport an elderly Isaac Newton from his old times to now, but we do it inside the chapel at Cambridge. He knew the chapel. Old building. He's like, oh, I'm here again. I know this place. Nothing weird. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure the electric lights are switched off and yeah, you have yeah. some candles around. And now you pull out an apple and show it to him. But the apple is an iPhone. Yes. You don't drop it on his head this time. No, you do not. But remember, Newton, besides gravity, he yeah. figured out light. He figured out how you could split up light, optics, and put it back together with prisms. So now you show him this iPhone. It's this little black device, and then you press the side button, and the screen lights up with incredible detailed light, like he has never seen a source of light that looks like that. Wow. Wow. Now you bring up an app and play a movie of an English country scene. So it's just out in the fields with animals that he's seen, and it's playing on this thing. It's moving light. All he could do with his prisms was split it into colors. Now maybe you go into iTunes and you play a piece of church music that he would have been familiar with. That machine can do that. Now you take photos of him and show him photos. You take a little movie and he sees himself. You turn on the flashlight and you show him in the dark corners underneath the pews that you can see stuff. It's a source of light and there are no flames. Oh, and then you go to the web and you find his personally annotated copy of his masterpiece, Principia, with his handwritten notes. And you can go and look at every page. His own handwriting and his own copy is inside this little box. What limits does he understand about that box? What limits? What could it not do? What could it not do? He probably would be flummoxed to realize that it's going to you know, run out of power in a few hours. This powerful machine, and it only works for a few hours, and you've got to do something else with it? That's pretty weird. Yeah, because he's never seen anything that has that property before. It just An is. Anvil. It is. It just is. He doesn't just keel over and die. Yeah. Yeah. And so he'll get that wrong. Totally. He would not understand that. Now, he would certainly assume that this incredibly powerful thing could light a candle. Yeah, I can do all this other stuff. And it's warm. Yeah. It feels warm. He doesn't know what it can do and what it can't. It seems omnipotent. If you gave him a list of 10 things it could do, five of which it could and five of which it couldn't, he would have no way of knowing which way to categorize. So applying this to super AI, we can imagine things that would almost surely be able to do. And extrapolating from that, we might imagine it could do anything. Yeah. And that's the argument that I get into with people when I talk about we're not going to have omnipotent AI anytime soon. They say, you don't understand how powerful it's going to be. And these are people who don't necessarily work in AI. You don't understand how powerful it's going to be. Neither do they. They have no clue. Just like Newton would have no clue of what it could do and what it can't do. Because it's so advanced that it's magic. It's nothing we've ever demonstrated anything close to. So you can't say anything rational about its properties. And then the boundaries vanish and we conceive of it as being functionally omniscient and omnipotent almost right out of the box, Yeah. when in reality, if it were to start going down the path to omniscience and omnipotent, there would probably be many side journeys along the way. Exactly. The next one, what you call performance versus competence. I think this is perhaps the most important one. When we see a person perform some task, we have a generally good understanding of what their competence around that task is. So if we see someone who play chess better than anyone else in the world, we think they can probably teach people to play chess. We think they can probably explain to us why a certain move was important. What was the critical move in the whole game and why? Chess playing programs are better than any human and they can't do either of those things. The only only way they teach people is by clobbering them. Clobbering them. Good game, bad game. Yeah. So when we see some program labeling images, young people playing Frisbee in the park, If a person wrote that down in English, those very words, you gave them the image, they wrote that down. 
you'd expect to be able to talk to them. Questions like, what's the weather like in that picture? What sort of day is it? What sort of day is it outside right now? How far could a person throw a Frisbee? Or what is a Frisbee? What's important about a Frisbee to be a Frisbee? You'd expect them to answer all those sorts of questions. Can you eat a Frisbee? Can you eat a Frisbee? Yes. Yeah. And the person doing it could. They've got a competence, understanding around frisbeeness if they can label something that programs don't know about weather beyond sometimes using weather words because of some way the image appears. But they don't know what weather is. They don't know what a person is. They don't know what a frisbee is. They don't know any of those things. And I'll certainly admit that when I see some of those eerily detailed mappings of descriptions of images that are coming out of the better image identifiers today, there is a presumption that when it says a group of young people playing frisbee in the park with a dog, that there is a wealth of understanding beneath that. But no, no notion of what a dog is, what a park is, what a frisbee is. The next one that I think is quite interesting is what you call exponentialism. The tendency to think that all tech, including AI, is exponential in nature because we have been exposed to that so many times and so impressively in such a life-changing way with so many things in technology. So would you like to talk about exponentialism? Yeah, so the example I use is from iPods from the early part of the century where every 12 months, for the same price, they were roughly $400 then, they were coming out with double the memory. And they went from 10 gigabytes to 20 gigabytes to 40 gigabytes. And I projected at the time and raised money for research off this projection that by now we'd have some... I think 160 terabytes. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where we'd be by now. But which yeah. we don't. But of the course. top of the line ones today are still 256 gigabytes. And why is that? Because what was driving it was wanting to get people's music collection on. And eventually the music collection fit and there was no more driver. There's market saturation. Market yeah. saturation. Yeah. So it just stopped. And so we tend to think, oh, it's getting better, better, better. But unless there's a market pull for it, it will stop. And also, we often confuse S-curves for exponential curves. Right. I mean, Moore's Law itself is probably an S-curve, right? Yeah, because we've gotten to the point where you can't halve the size of the features anymore. You've got to do something different, which I think is actually a great thing for computer architecture, but that's another whole story. Yeah, yeah. Another example is GPS has gotten better and better and better, but at some point, you don't need sub-micron GPS to drive your car. It's funny because I made the same mistake that you did in looking at iPods because I was working in online music at the time. And I remember wondering if I'd done the right thing in creating Rhapsody as a streaming service because it seemed unbelievably obvious to me that within 10 years, there'd be no need for streaming. You would just buy a device that came preloaded with all the music ever recorded, which would fit into a disk drive very easily. And you'd just get these wireless updates whenever Beyonce recorded a new song. I almost got to the point where I was like, we've really blown it here. I mean, we're a little ahead of the curve with Rhapsody, but there's going to be no need for this. Right. So what are the ramifications for those who do think about the existential risk of a notional super AI? Very bright people like Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates and Elon Musk, they have at least three things in common. One, they're all brilliant. Two, they're all very, very concerned about super AI risk. And you pointed out that they have a third thing in common. None of them has worked in AI. I respect all of them greatly, but I think they are making some of these other mistakes. There may be super AI way in the future, but we don't know what the risks are going to look like. You go back to 1789. First hot air balloon is floating over Paris with people in it. And some people worried their souls would get sucked out. What's going to happen to those people up there? I don't think there was a single person in Paris on that day that worried about it. We have to worry about noise abatement, where these things are ultimately going to land. That's going to be the limiting factor on these things, how much noise they make. That was not the issue. That is an issue. That's why you get so much pushback against an extra runway at so many airports, but you couldn't tell that 220 years ago. And so when I think these things are a longer time scale, we can't begin to understand what the real issues will be. So I think we should be much more worried about other issues that we have in tech, why our infrastructure is so leaky. Why is it that even our home thermostats can be used as attack vectors by putting viruses in them? So I think there are much more immediate questions that come up. How is it that fake news is going to affect our lives and our politics? I think there are a lot of issues that we see problems right today. The problems about super AI are way off in the future and we can't say anything sensible. So there are a lot of very serious efforts underway right now to mitigate the risk that a future super AI could pose to society. In Berkeley, there's an organization called MIRI, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. Elon Musk generously funded the Future of Life Institute. Would you say that they're wasting their time? I think they are. 
some of these people you've named said we have to regulate. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's my question. If you're going to have a regulation and it doesn't change anyone's behavior, there's no point having the regulation. There's only a point if it changes something. What is it you want to change? What is it? Tell me one example of what it is you want to change. I'm not sure how many are arguing for regulation. What I hear more about is what they call the alignment problem. The danger of a super AI having and pursuing goals which are inconsistent with humanity's well-being and perhaps its future existence. Right. And the alignment problem has nothing to do with AI. The alignment problem is a real problem. And the alignment problem exists in Facebook, it exists in Google, it exists in all these platforms. And those companies founded by my friends, I'm not saying they're evil, but there's an alignment problem there. And may, some might argue, destroy our democracy. I imagine some of the people who work in that field might respond something like this. Nobody claims to know precisely when this intelligence explosion will occur. Few of the most concerned people would guarantee with 100% conviction that it's even going to happen. But looking at recent history and the compounding and self-reinforcing effects of technological advancement, we can probably say that arbitrarily amazing things will be possible in the 50 to 100-year time frame, maybe 200-year time frame. Long for a human, but short for humanity. In light of that, what's the argument against working on this problem now? And if now is not the right time frame, what sign do we need? What development would it take for us to say, wow, now is time to start thinking about this or working on this or worrying about this? Well, let me take two angles at that. One is I think we were more likely to see earlier than the pure AI something which involves biological material. I think that's a much shorter way to get to it, to renegade intelligence. Biological, oh, really a development of intelligence. Because you could build on intelligence that already exists. You reshape it some way. You're trying to build something. And, so brain-machine interfaces? Yeah, it could be around that, or it could be just a biologically edited animal. Or organoids. Yeah, I think we're much more likely to see existential risks from them in the short. And you're not talking about bioweapons. You're talking about biological intelligence. Yes. Very interesting. Yeah. I've never heard that before. Yeah, I think that's much more likely in the short term. I'm personally very good at fretting about synthetic biology, but I've never thought about synthetic biological well, intelligence. Well, uh, yeah, animals are pretty damn intelligent. They're not yeah. that far from us. If you yeah. look along the evolutionary chain... So take some existing animal and you give it a few extra things or who knows what that's going to be like. And it could even be purely biological with the power of CRISPR and design. Yeah. That's an earlier existential yep. risk. And we don't really know what that looks like, by the way. You hadn't even thought of it. I hadn't, no. Right. So then we get to an AI system. It's got computers and it's got sensors and it's computational. What are the early warnings that we have to worry about? Self-awareness intentionality, a AI program for which tomorrow is different from today. There's no ongoing flow of time. For dogs, there's ongoing flow of time. Certainly for octopuses, which are very different intelligence, evolved completely different from mammals. We don't have anything, anything remotely showing any of those signs. So until you can have dangerous AI, you have to have some sort of ongoing existence, some sort of ability to plan, um, some sort of ability to understand what's happening, some intention. We don't have any of those things, even in a rudimentary form. We don't have them at the level of an insect. So I'm not worried that we're close to it. And furthermore, just like you hadn't thought of the natural intelligence of an animal, I don't think we know what it's going to look like. Until we see some of them, we won't know that sort's okay, or well, this sort's starting to look a little bad. Before we have robots that are really dangerous, we're going to have robots that are really annoying. Telemarketing bots. We're going to have all sorts of things along the way. And I think we'll start to understand what the landscape looks like and regulate, as should be. We regulate all our other technologies, except for guns, for some reason. And so it may be a fun game. It's like the trolley problem, indistinguishable from magic. We don't know any properties, so we can imagine any properties we like, which is great for an academic wanting to write papers. If uh, people want to work on the alignment problem, you would rather have them work on the alignments of things that are currently in our world and causing havoc. Causing havoc. Well, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, I probably could pose six more hours of questions to you, but I won't do that because we've spent a lot of time together. Thank you very, very kindly for your time. 
And um, hopefully at some point we can reconnect and talk about some of the other amazing ideas that you've put forth in your blog, because there's many, many vectors we didn't even touch on. Yeah, and this has been a really enjoyable conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Rodney's purview into tech's past, present, and future is remarkably deep and wide. And as someone who's done a fair amount of fretting about the potential threats of super AI, my recent 547-page novel being Exhibit A, I take a fair amount of comfort from his sheer lack of concern about risks on this front. But not overwhelming comfort, because I can't think of any other issue in high tech which divides quite so many brilliant minds quite so vehemently. Rodney is, of course, correct that super AI skeptics, including Bill Gates, Elon Musk, and the very recently and very dearly departed Stephen Hawking, were never full-time denizens of this field. But while that limits their direct expertise in it, it also leaves them unconflicted in considering these issues. Upton Sinclair once said that it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. And many of those who are most dismissive about super AI risks are among those who could gain the most from its rapid and headlong development. That said, Rodney's own salary is in no way dependent upon advances in general artificial intelligence, as he's been a roboticist first and foremost for many, many years. So I'll repeat, the combination of his complete lack of alarm and extreme depth in this field gives me comfort. But I'll also repeat, not total comfort. I'm quite intrigued by Rodney's frontline reports about factory worker shortages as far back as the 90s in what was then the poster child of cheap, abundant labor, China. I've done some digging since our interview and came across a recent-ish article in The Atlantic titled China's Twilight Years, which says that the country's ratio of retirees to active workers will drop as low as 1.6 to 1 within about 20 years. That is an economy which will need help keeping its factories humming particularly if humanity doesn't get really good at creating robots that can help with elder care, as Rondi so rightly pointed out, because factories are going to have to compete with that very important and burning human need. Now, some listeners may dismiss a roboticist's claims about robots not imperiling factory jobs as being biased or self-serving. However, since our interview, I've tracked down a number of deployments of Rodney's robots on YouTube and elsewhere, and they generally seem to be in roles that enhance the productivity of the humans they share the factory floor with. And this makes sense, because remember, these next-generation robots are all about flexibility and reprogrammability, and they need human hands and brains to pivot them from task to task and to train and tweak their actions. All of this kind of reminds me of the concerns that accompany the rise of ATM machines— Those little boxes seem to constitute an existential threat to the very title of bank teller. But over the years following their appearance, the number of tellers actually climbed significantly. The reason seemed obvious in retrospect, which was, with ATMs doing the simplest tasks, tellers started focusing on much higher value things, which made them much more valuable to their employers. It's a truism that when something becomes more valuable, we tend to buy more or hire more of it. This was true for tellers after ATMs took over the most mundane aspects of their jobs, and it could be true for many factory workers who team up with robots like Rodney's. A third element of Rodney's thinking that really intrigues me is what he calls exponentialism. Living in these decades of steady, compounding improvement in computer performance has made all of us prone to this. But Moore's law just doesn't apply to everything. Brief periods of rapid development followed by long periods of relative equilibrium are the rule in most dynamic fields. This has in fact been true about biological evolution for billions of years. And more recently, we've seen this in air travel among hundreds of other industries. Planes got much faster quite suddenly when jet engines entered the scene, but they haven't sped up a whole lot since then. Punctuated equilibrium is common even in high-tech realms that we most associate with Silicon Valley. Consider Rodney's own field of robotics. From the time when the first factory robots appeared in a New Jersey car factory in the 60s until just a few years ago, substantially all industrial robots were caged. But just a few swift years after Rodney's company rolled out its first product, thousands of uncaged robots are now strutting their stuff at major industry trade shows. Meanwhile, Rodney's point about the seemingly sudden emergence of neural networks and backpropagation is an important lesson for all of us. A 30-year marathon can easily look like a three-year sprint to outsiders, significantly distorting our perspective. 
We'll hear about another intriguing example of this phenomenon in the next episode of this podcast when I'll be talking to George Church. George is arguably the single most influential person in the worlds of synthetic biology and genomics. He was one of the earliest drivers behind the Human Genome Project. He's one of the two most prominent inventors of the gene editing technology known as CRISPR. He's been involved in the creation of almost 100 startups, 22 of which he co-founded. And his Harvard lab is one of the most celebrated fonts of innovation in the entire world of life science. George has spent decades pushing his industry down cost improvement curves that are even steeper than the one that drives computing. The speed with which we can decipher and synthesize DNA has been increasing at an exponential rate that lacks any precedent in technology history. But even this breakneck realm is one of punctuated equilibrium, in which long-term developments can seem very sudden to outsiders, again, distorting our perspective. I hope you join me for this fascinating conversation with one of the world's top scientists next time. And I do hope that some of you now join me on Patreon for quite a few extra thoughts about Rodney and his extraordinary thinking, because there's quite a lot to say. In this bonus content for patrons, I focus mainly on several fascinating essays that Rodney has published on the internet. In preparing to interview him, I quite literally read every blog post that he has ever written, and I was awed by the wide range of topics that he tackles. In the Patreon recording, I talk about the pieces that fascinate me the most. The episode runs almost 20 minutes, so I guess you can kind of think of it as the last quarter of this week's podcast. And once again, to access that, go to patreon.com slash Rob Reed, R-E-I-D. And if you support the podcast at the $5 per month level or above, you can hear that as well as all the extra segments that I posted for other episodes. And finally, as mentioned in the intro, please help me spread the word. If you're hearing this and you are, it means that the tweet announcing Rodney's episode has been posted to my Twitter feed. My handle is Rob underscore Reed. That's R-E-I-D. And follow me while you're at it, if you feel like it. Now, to set a low bar, my previous episode was retweeted just five times, and my all-time record for an episode is eight retweets. 15,000 of you are hearing this, so if we don't shatter that record, I'm going to be depressed for weeks. Alternatively, or perhaps in addition, please consider finding a more handcrafted way to spread word about the podcast than a simple retweet, like you could write a personal introduction to your retweet, spread the word on Facebook, or tell a tiny handful of friends who you think might especially enjoy the show. The future of this podcast after June 30th hangs in the balance, and only you can save it. And I hope that was an effective use of guilt, although it probably wasn't. I was raised Episcopal, and amongst the major religions and their many denominations, we apparently have a very low guilt market share, but I did my best. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join me and George Church next time. Mm-hmm.